Now I move to questions to the Minister of Education. I call Mr. John O'Dowd. Question one. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with your permission, I'll answer questions one and three together. But I say it's probably a slightly surreal experience that the first question I receive is from the former Education Minister. Um, I almost feel I'm in one of those sort of body swap uh, comedies of, uh, from Hollywood in that regard. I, I would indicate that uh, it also, while he has the opportunity, if he can uh, let me know where the money has been hidden in the department, uh, I've greatly uh, received that information as well. Turning to the question it's, itself, I think that I welcome the improvement of GCSE outcomes that are detailed in the recent publication of our performance. You know, we often, I think, within education, deal with obviously many of the problems that are facing uh, the subject matter, but sometimes we don't actually celebrate the success, and particularly celebrate the success and the achievements that have occurred, which, to which the credit will go to our young people, our teachers and school leavers. And there has been, I think, in recent years, in terms of school leavers achieving five GCSEs or more, a steady uh, increase in terms of the, an improvement in the results, and not simply across the board, but particularly, I think, has been welcoming that the gap uh, of those on free school meals, for instance, those who are from socially deprived backgrounds, that uh, there's been a greater speed of improvement uh, than other sectors. And while there's much work still to be done, that is something, I think, to be cherished and uh, built upon. Uh, that has, has occurred because of a wide range of factors, but particularly the support that's been provided, particularly to schools, which is something I'd be keen to uh, encourage and indeed support, particularly the, the school budget, and a range of interventions. And I'm keen that where uh, we see improvements within the, the school system, uh, that those are protected uh, in albeit difficult financial circumstances, and where there are interventions which perhaps need to happen where the speed of improvement has not been uh, fast enough, I'm keen to see whatever improvements can be made uh, within that. Dad for a supplementary. Uh, Gormley Owitz, can call you. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And can I take this opportunity to publicly congratulate Mr Weir on his appointment uh, to the Education Minister? It's a vitally important role within our executive and within our society, and I wish him every success with it. Uh, unfortunately, I can't tell him where the money is hidden in the Department of Education because, unfortunately, there was no money left uh, to hide anywhere, and I, I know the financial pressures uh, he will face coming in the future. And Would he agree with me that education is one of those areas where it's vitally important that the executive work together because many of the issues facing our young people in relation to educational underachievement are actually factors outside of the school and which are impacting on young people's lives outside of the school. And I, I do co notice comment that when he refers to the increase in GCSE results for our young people. This previous executive and the executive before I'll ask you minister to come to a question. Yes, I've seen a 10% increase uh, in GCSE results for our young people. So it, would the minister agree with me that it proves that regardless of who the local minister is, that we can do things better for ourselves? Well, I think we should always be ambitious while there have been improvements. And I thank the, the member for his congratulations. Um, I think that while we have seen clear success in terms of improvements in, in exam results, we should always be ambitious and actually look to see where we can make further improvements. It is also the case, I think, that uh, education is a key driver, both in terms of the economy, in terms of society as a whole, but I, I think most vitally in terms of education. It, it's the difference that it can make to an individual's life. You know, I think that for many young people, education can be the game changer in their lives, and that's where I think we've always got to think of the individual uh, within that. I certainly hope that the executive will give that priority to education. Uh, we are obviously in very difficult uh, and tough financial circumstances, so that will not be easy, but uh, certainly, particularly if there's any help that the member opposite can give, certainly if he wants to have a word with the Honourable Member for South Belfast when it comes to um, financing education, I, I will be grateful for whatever help from whatever source uh, it is delivered from. I call Mr Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the, the Minister for his answer so far and welcome him to his first uh, question time. Can the Minister give an indication of what progress has been made to raise edu educational attainment at GCSE level amongst uh, working class Protestant boys? Okay, thank you. There, there obviously have been a number of groups, we've, we've, I've mentioned it across the board, uh, that there has been an overall improvement in terms of educational attainment. Uh, that has been mirrored uh, in a range of groups which traditionally have underachieved. And I suppose particularly, for instance, if we take the free school meals entitlement as a, as a yardstick, uh, we've seen over the, the last uh, eight years uh, an increase of a virtually doubling of the number of um, 
Protestant free school meal entitled boys uh, in terms of their achievement. That still, however, leaves a considerable gap uh, from the average in terms of the, uh, the levels of achievement. Uh, I'll be looking, and indeed, it's noticeable, for instance, that uh, in both the Protestant and Catholic communities, that the level of, of increased success amongst girls has appeared more rapidly than it has amongst boys. And I think there's, there's a gender issue there as well to be looked at. I'll be looking at particularly where there still are weaker educational outcomes to see what interventions can be tailored uh, for those people. I, I think the previous minister also made a very valid point that while we'll be focusing in on what happens in schools, there are a wide range of interventions, and we had a debate last week, particularly on early intervention, uh, which a lot of that is critical as well to the long-term success. And I think particularly in education, we need to ensure that we're also looking at things in a, a long-term perspective, because if you're making interventions with children that are two or three, for instance, uh, the impact that will happen in terms of exam results may well be 10 or 15 years down the line, but we shouldn't shy away from making those interventions simply because we're not seeing the fruits of our intervention at a very um, swift stage. Well, Mr. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before the new minister rushes to congratulate or give credit to the former minister for improvements in GCSE results in Northern Ireland students, can he reflect on the former minister's comments when in post that Northern Ireland does not have a world-class education system and that, quote, we remain average by OECD standards and we still have too many young people who do not achieve as expected level in literacy and numeracy? John O'Dowd, 21st to the 11th. 11. I think there's always room, uh, always room for improvement. I, I should highlight as well the latest GCSE figures came out the morning after I became minister, so I, I'm not actually passing that praise on to the former minister. I'm claiming that for myself <laughs> in that regard. Uh, but it's clear, you know, I'm not going to get into a little bit of he said, she said territory. I think what we do have is there are many successes within our education system which we do need uh, to acknowledge. But that is, it is also the case that we've got to be ambitious for our children and actually see where improvements uh, can be made. So I, I would hope the whole House could unite around that as a, as a positive agenda rather than to try to analyse uh, where we believe that we are, are, are failing in that regard. It's about making those, those important improvements. I call Ms Sinead Bradley, but I do remind members that if they want to ask a supplementary, they should continually stand. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Minister, and welcome to your first question time. Uh, does the Minister share in the concern that pupil attainment going forward may actually be compromised due to the reduction in number of awarding bodies available now because of changes in the grading system elsewhere? I think from that point of view, there's a separate issue in terms of the grading issue, and I know I think there's questions later on that I'll be coming to. My aim, actually, with that is to try to... to whether you call them maintain or restore an open market in qualifications. And as such, I've been working with officials and the key bodies to see what actions can be taken to solve that, that problem. I think it is important that the choices are there for schools and also that we have an outcomes-based uh, focus which ensures that for uh, pupils themselves, that whenever they receive qualifications, there's clear comparability and portability because it, it goes beyond simply the qualification that they receive. It's how they're able to use that, that in the future. But that is an ongoing issue which I hope to be able to provide some level of certainty to the House relatively soon. I appreciate for a lot of schools, they are faced with a situation of particular choices uh, come September. And it's important that at the very least we establish a clear direction of travel for that issue uh, as soon as possible. So I'm acutely aware uh, of that issue. It's an issue I've already had initial discussions with officials on. Call Mr. Jim Allister. On that theme, could I encourage the Minister to address that with some urgency? It's great to have good GCSE results. But they must be relevant in the sense they must be portable. And given the disastrous decision by his predecessor, surely it is imperative for the minister to reverse that decision at the earliest opportunity. Well, I always take encouragement for the, the, um, the member sort of with, with great faith, and so I, I welcome that from him. It is important that we get resolution to this issue, and I think from that point of view, it's not simply a question of uh, previous minister did X, I have to go entirely in the opposite direction. The key element of this will be the outcome space, which the, the member does highlight that the significance of the comparability and portability of the exam results, which for the individual student will be the, the key test. That will be the basis upon which uh, I'm seeking a, a resolution. I am 
acutely aware, uh, and I agree with the, Minister of the, uh, sorry, with the member of the urgency of the, the issue. That's why I've held initial discussions with that, and I would hope that we can make progress on that very quickly. I think there's a need to make progress on that, that very quickly. Call Mr. Chris Little. Question number two. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, with your permission, I'll also answer question uh, 11 with this. I think the two relate together. Uh, I met with the Chair Interim Chief Executive of the Education Authority on the 7th of June to address the Authority's review. The Chair informed me that while good progress has been made on uh, many aspects of the review, issues associated with the planning and provision of preschool places in uh, special schools are complex and sensitive and will require very careful engagement with principals and parents. I emphasised uh, to the, the Chair the need for meaningful engagement uh, with those who are directly affected. The Chair has assured me that the review will involve the establishment of a professional practitioner group and also a parent stakeholder group. It is anticipated that the review itself will take a further six months to complete. The Authority has assured me that it will not be implementing any substantive arrangements uh, in terms of any review before September 2017. There is, however, the need for uh, preschool places in special schools, which are anticipated to increase by around about 20 per cent by September uh, 2016. The EA has therefore agreed to a number of interim measures to uh, extend early years provision across the special school sector to meet these immediate demands. The Authority has confirmed that it is engaged with schools involved uh, and they are fully aware with, of those plans. The EA has uh, advised that it is taking a careful and considered approach with interim steps to meet the needs of children for September 2016, while planning and engaging on a longer-term approach that puts children uh, and their needs to the forefront. I can assure members that no long-term decision in this matter will be made prior to the completion of this review, and I will continue to monitor progress to ensure that the Authority delivers on what it said to me and delivers on its commitments. Mr. Little for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Education Minister and the Education Authority, on one hand, speak of no new substantive arrangements and then outline substantive interim measures. Does the Education Minister accept that this approach is leaving parents feeling anxious and confused? Will he make clear his support for the retention of full time hours in special educational needs nursery schools? And will he accept my invitation to meet with parents on this important matter? Well, taking I suppose, a couple of those, those issues, first of all, it is not universal across the way, and has not been universal that there is full-time provision for special needs. It has been of a differential uh, form across the, the board. Now, if you take a look in terms of there is a range of measures that have been taken, also in some cases where there have been, for instance, uh, provision at present of around about two or two and a half hours, that those are actually extending now to, to three hours. We are left with a situation, and it's an issue of capacity, to try to ensure that, that in the interim arrangements, um, that because of the pressures that are there, that there is a place for every child. That is the most crucial element to this, and I have to make that, that degree of provision. We are left with a situation, and many of these many occasions where children are presenting because of uh, assessments even over the summer, where that figure is not finalised, and we're actually moving almost a daily basis in terms of increases. So we're left with a situation that in the interim situation there is a, an increase of around about 20 per cent. And as such, um, there is an attempt by the EA, whose primary responsibility in terms of placements, to try and ensure that there are sufficient places, that there is at least a place for every child in that regard. Now, he mentioned about full-time places. I'm not going to prejudge the outcome of the overall uh, review, but the key thing is actually trying to ensure at least there's something in place then for children in, in 2016. That is fairly clear. And I think it is important with that that we give that level of reassurance that there is a clarity around that. I will be happy to meet parents at, at some stage. I think the initial contact, because it is the responsibility of the EA, has got to be that direct conversation between the EA and parents on that basis. So I think that that is the, the initial contact, but I'm, I'm more than happy as part of this process to be meeting uh, representatives of parents. Well, Ms. Rosemary Barr. Oh, sorry. LinkedIn with 11. Yes. Was that that was moving, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to the Minister. The fresh start agreement on the opposition position indicates that the first question after 
uh, is to go to a member of the opposition. So therefore, I call Ms. Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Jenny Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, would the Minister agree and can he give an assurance to this Assembly that we have confidence in the review of the special educational needs provision at nursery level when it has been alleged that in March the former Education Committee was given erroneous information by an official that Fleming Fulton Nursery School was closed? Could the Minister correct the record and assure us that the existing capacity for nursery provision at Fleming Fulton is fully recognised and fully, fully utilised? Will parents whose children have a statement of physical disability with associated learning needs and have expressed a preference Ask the to member attend to come Fleming to her Fulton? Question. Ask the member to come to her question. Would the Minister give an assurance on that? In terms of the issue specifically of it's clear that there was wrong information that was given to the uh, that was given to the committee. I suppose, if you like, I have a particular axe to grind in this. I think I was actually chair of the committee whenever that wrong information was given, uh, and the EA have, have entirely acknowledged that. In terms of the confidence on the, the approach itself, I think that's why it's important that the review is not one that is simply rushed. That indeed there is an opportunity, very directly, for proper engagement, uh, particularly with parents, particularly with schools, uh, on that on that basis. Um, you know, too often, I suppose, there is always the allegation that, that consultation on any form of review or any consultation that, that is issued simply becomes a tick box exercise. It is important, I think, on this issue more than any other that that is, that is not the case. As regards to the specifics of, of Fleming Fulton, it's a school that I've visited on a number of occasions. I'm aware of the, uh, the issues around that, uh, and I know that there's a lot of good work that is, is happening within Fleming Fulton. As regards the broad position of uh, nursery places, we are assuring people that there will be a place for every child. It is a, a key issue in terms of ensuring that the provision is made. Now, whether that will be uh, of the exact duration that, that every parent wants is something that cannot be guaranteed because we have to make arrangements in terms of the capacity that, that's there. But we will make sure that no child is left behind in ensuring that there will be. Indeed, as we move ahead with the review, it is also clear that um, different children will have different needs. Special, special educational needs is quite often thrown out as just a loose term by people uh, when it actually covers a, a wide multitude of uh, situations in that regard. And what will actually be of, um, of benefit to one particular child with special needs may not be the same to another child. And I think that's also something that's got to be taken with a degree of cognizance as we move ahead uh, with the review. Well, Ms. Naomi Law. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware um, that the Education Authority failed previously to disclose the opposition of parents to their proposals. I realise that he has indicated that that should be the first point of call for parents um, is directly with the Education Authority, but what reassurance can he give parents um, that going forward the arrangements put in place by the Education Authority will be more open and transparent and effective in taking on board their views and reflecting them in the decision-making process? process than they have been to date? Well, I think from that point of view, the only assurances that can be given is the fact that, that we are part of a, a lengthy process. It is not something which is simply being bounced through. And there's indications, I think, that uh, the Education Authority has already started to, to meet some parents and indeed will be trying to work through not simply professional practitioners, but also a, a stakeholder group. Uh, as indicated, there are complex issues with this, and that is why the Education Authority is taking a level of, of time. It is also the case that, that, from that point of view, I will be scrutinising what will be happening. And indeed, if there is a lack of real engagement, then that is something I will bring forward to the, the Education Authority. Uh, you know, I can only seek assurances and push people to give those assurances and then try and make sure that those are delivered in practice. Uh, but I will make sure that that, that is the case. Well, Ms Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to congratulate the Minister on his first question time and thank him for coming to Dromore 
yesterday too for the church service for the Central Primary School. Minister, you're well aware of the crushing pressures that special needs schools are under and statement of children within mainstream schools. So can I ask you what action are you taking in relation to overall funding pressures in special education needs? Uh, thank the member for her question. I'll have to uh, pass on my best wishes to Damore Central Primary. We had a very good day yesterday with the, the service to acknowledge their 78 years as, as a school. You know, it's clear that, that uh, beyond simply the pressures that are there on the nursery side, and I've mentioned that the figures would suggest that we're in the region of about a 20% increase this year in terms of the, the children who are seeking a place within uh, special, uh, special nursery provision. There has been increasing demand for SEN support and costs associated. Indeed, many of those things include virtuous things in our society. That, that it is thankful, for instance, that some children who previously, in terms of their life, uh, expectancy has increased greatly. So I think that's something that we should welcome. But it's also the case that in terms of the percentage of SEN pupils, uh, that in terms of those with a statement has increased, for instance, from around about 4.3% just four years ago to just under 5% now. There's a significant amount of the EA budget that's being spent on special education services, such as both special schools, special support services, classroom assistance, transport costs. Uh, that funding has been protected as part of the budget setting process of the last years and additional funding for SEN has been secured uh, from the executive as part of its in-year uh, monitoring grounds. Should the EA identify budget pressures for SEN and if they can't be met within the education budget, I will continue to work with the executive to secure additional funding and indeed in terms of sudden budgetary pressures that was part of the monitoring round bids that we, we put in. And, uh, I will be hopeful that the Honourable Member for South Belfast will be able to deliver on those uh, in the near future. Oh, Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if this House is to have faith in any future consultations carried out by the Education Authority, would the Minister agree that given the fact that we have had misleading information presented to the House, that we have dissatisfaction by a major stakeholder in this process, which was the parents, and that the consequent extension of the uh, deadline of this process to, to accommodate a, a different outcome, does he agree that an internal uh, investigation would be required to learn lessons from this? I think where mistakes are made, there's always an opportunity to learn lessons. I think that will be, be critical. I mean, uh, let us be clear on this. There, there was clearly mistakes made by the EA, and particularly in terms of failure to give uh, information. Uh, and I take that, that very seriously. In terms of the time scale, it is actually to ensure that we actually get a proper, uh, robust outcome. I mean, there's a very serious issue in terms of the provision of special needs education, particularly at, at nursery level. And that can't be something which simply a couple of meetings within the EA without consultation can simply um, follow through in terms of a, a report. It's got to be substantive in its nature. It's got to be carefully uh, examined. And indeed, there's a key role in which there are representatives of all sectors within that. that this is not simply something which can be driven by officials, but has to go through uh, the full board of the Education Authority to have that scrutiny to which I think most of the major parties, for instance, have at least representatives on and indeed representative of all, of all sectors. So it's, it's that sort of robust approach which hopefully will build uh, some level of confidence. I, I suppose, as with any review or any report, there is no guarantee that whatever outcome will satisfy everyone on that basis. But we've got, we've got to try and ensure that we get the best possible uh, outcome from that review. Well, Mr Keith Buchanan. Hey, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, question four, please. Uh, the School Enhancement Programme is a capital bill programme targeted to meet the immediate and pressing needs in schools through smaller scale works. It caters for construction costs that will be between half a million um, and four million. 51 schools uh, were originally approved in uh, March 2014 to the benefit of uh, a total estimated value of 134 million. And 12 of those schemes have now been completed. Indeed, my first week as Minister, I was able to visit one of those at Belfast High School uh, to see the, the good work that had happened there. There are further 20 uh, pro uh, projects that are currently on site, with another 14 to be approved to move to construction and expected uh, on site over the summer. There are two schemes which are currently parked following the completion of their design. Uh, they will move to construction as soon as funding becomes available. These are St Malachy's uh, contract number two and Our Lady's Voluntary Grammar School. The remaining five SEP schemes are continuing to advance uh, to design completion, at which point they will also be held until capital funding becomes available. 
Mr Buchanan for his supplementary. Hey, thank you, Mr Speaker, and thanks the Minister for his answer. Can I also ask the Minister for uh, an update on the School Enhancement Programme project at Rainey Endowed School in Macrofelt, my own constituency, and what future funding opportunities through the programme could there be for the school? Obviously, uh, in, within this House, all politics is local, and obviously uh, welcome the members' interest, particularly in Rainey Endowed. That has been uh, the project addresses internal refurbishment of the existing school accommodation and replacement of old mobile classrooms uh, with new modular classroom uh, units. In addition, the project will also have a new build permanent physical education facility. Uh, the project has a financial director approved costs of around four million, which covers construction costs, professional fees, statutory charges, F and E and VAT. The contract itself was broken down into two parts. Uh, contract one, which was commenced on site in September 2014 and was completed August 2015. That provided new modular buildings to address an urgent shortfall in accommodation. Uh, the works contract was, was carried out by Lowry Construction. Uh, contract to uh, commence work on site uh, on March 2016 and is due to complete on site uh, March 2017. It will provide a new sports hall and ancillary facilities. Work is being undertaken by uh, that has been undertaken by Dixon contractors is progressing well. I will have the opportunity to think later on this week, along with uh, one other engagement in the Mid-Ulster area, uh, to visit the school to actually see for myself the progress that is being made. But we're also in a position that in terms of um, the school enhancement programme, as well as progressing um, those, uh, if you like, works that have already been announced, uh, it is likely that given the success of the SEP programme that there will be further calls and indeed there will be the opportunity for schools across Northern Ireland in a, in a fair and competitive basis to make applications. So simply because a school has received some level of support in the past will not preclude them from potentially receiving that support in the future. Mr Declan McAuley. Uh, uh, Minister, are there any new bills which could be impacted upon due to budgetary pressures? I think we're in a position, clearly from a budgetary point of view, uh, in terms of the overall SEP uh, position, uh, that from the point of view of the, the capital spend on SEP, uh, we have it as a situation in which there's been a considerable level of announcement on that. There are pressures clearly within the education budget in general, and, and from that point of view it's no different from any other department. Those pressures are in the strongest position where uh, they are on the resource side. There are greater opportunities, however, on the, the capital side now. It will mean at times that, that there may be delays in projects in terms of how quickly they move forward, but the opportunities are there. And I have seen, I think, at first hand in terms of the advantage of, of SEPs, in that the, the speed of movement on them can be a lot greater than the normal cap, full-scale capital build. Uh, so from that point of view, uh, I would anticipate that we'll be in a position to make further calls for SEP projects. Uh, and I want to make sure that whenever we get progress on those, that we don't have a situation where things simply become part and they're not in a position to, to progress. It's, it's important to think when announcements are made that they're then followed through on. Well, Mr. Richie McPhillip. I thank the Minister for his answer so far, and may I wish him well in his new ministry. In my own constituency of Manus South Tyrone, there is a great need to upgrade the existing school infrastructure to ensure that it is fit for the 21st century. In light of this, can the Minister provide us an update on the progress on being made under the scheme in the redevelopment of Mount Lord's Grammar School and the Air and Integrated College, both in Enniskillen? Uh, in terms of the detail of those two proposals, I'll, I'll, it may be better, rather than try to, to fit this into a, a short sort of answer at this stage, I'll maybe write giving the member the, the detail on that. Uh, clearly, as we move ahead, uh, all areas of Northern Ireland will be treated equally as in terms of proposals for capital bill. We will have a robust system, robust criteria in that regard. And I am sure all members will share in the desire for their own constituencies to see particular capital build. Uh, you know, I, I should say one of the byproducts of being in Dromore yesterday was that I think the entire departmental budget could well have been blown in, in Dromore if it was to accede to request yesterday. And I, I appreciate that that may find favour with at least one member here uh, today. But in terms of the details of the two schemes, um, I'll write to the member outlining that because I think it's, it's better than trying to squeeze it in an extra minute. That ends the period for listed questions. We now have up to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Alan Chambers.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to congratulate my colleague from North Down on his elevation to ministerial office. Uh, can I ask the Minister for Education for his assessment of the education budget that he has inherited from his predecessor? Thank the member for his good wishes and uh, can assure him of, of in a similar element of, of, of uh, good wishes that I'll continue to use his shop in Grimsport uh, as, as we move ahead. Uh, from that point of view, yes, we're in, I think, tight financial situation. As I indicated, there are pressures on the resource budget, uh, and those are particularly acute when it comes to schools funding. Uh, and I'll be looking, rising out of then what happens with the, um, with the monitoring round, that once that is out of the way, to do a certain level of reassessment within the, the broader education budget to see if there is, at least in the short term, more money that can be then, uh, a small amount can at least be allocated to ease some of the burdens uh, within schools. There's a wider examination, I think, that needs to take place within the, the broader education budget to ensure that we're getting as much frontline delivery as, as possible. That will be a longer exercise because, uh, as with a lot of things within education, and indeed with other government departments, it's not that easy simply to turn things around uh, very quickly. Uh, but undoubtedly we're in a situation where, because of wider decisions taken within the, the national budget, that I think for every minister we're trying to operate on the basis of a level of funding where it would be a lot easier uh, if there was additional money that was available to us on that basis, but we have to make do with what, what is there, unless I'm able to find the, um, the money that, that uh, John O'Dowd is hidden somewhere. Mr. Chambers for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I know that uh, before the election, uh, Mr. Speaker, the thing that was exercising the headmasters of the schools uh, was the, uh, the unplanned uh, increases on teacher salaries, pension contributions, and national insurance contributions that had been placed uh, as a, bur a burden onto the school budgets. Uh, I just wonder uh, if the minister has identified uh, a solution to that, and also. Uh, can he give uh, any hope to the three schools in North Down that have been waiting for a rebuild uh, that perhaps uh, in the short term that they may uh, achieve the funding for those rebuilds? Thank you. Okay. Thank the member for all of his questions uh, that he's asked in relation to that. Uh, can I say that, first of all, as regards the, the pressures on the, the pension side of it, there was about £30 million of, of pressures. That has been actually some, there, there's perhaps a little bit of confusion around that because that has actually been built into the aggregate schools budget. Uh, and indeed, I think the £30 million pressure came and has been put in as part of the main line with, within that. Uh, the issue of the £22 million, I think, comes from the national insurance uh, side of things. Um, that uh, is something which is actually hit across the, the public sector because it's decisions that have been taken uh, at at Westminster on that, but that's undoubtedly a major stress that is there for schools. I, I'm looking both in terms of if there's any additional funding can be found in the short term from within the budget from 2016-17. Obviously, as part of the overall process of the monitoring round, there was a bid put in, which has previously been indicated would be uh, was part of a, an earlier indication of around 15 million that would be there in terms of the school monitoring or the aggregate schools budget, I'll be working to ensure that hopefully that will be delivered. Uh, but it's also a question of seeing if there's any short-term actions that could be taken which can ease the, the pressures on, on school budgets uh, as well. In terms of the, the capital build, uh, well again, uh, as indicated, we are in a position that while there is heavy pressure on the resource side of it, uh, whereas I suspect the capital budget could be spent four or five times over, there is at least less of a pressure on that because there has been a degree of protected growth both in terms of the, the main budget itself and also in terms of the additional funding that has been there in terms of the shared and integrated uh, schooling, uh, which indeed is capital funding that has come separately from, from the government. Uh, specifically, two of the schools uh, that, are, that the member, I think, was re referring to, there was an announcement shortly before the election that they have, if you like, put their first rung on the ladder of getting that level of improvement in terms of Bangor Central uh, and Priory. And obviously, linked in with Priory will be the wider... Uh, Hollywood Schools project. Uh, I'm acutely aware of the situation is at St Columbanus as well and the pressures uh, that are there. As regards future funding, uh, that will be in, uh, on, there will be opportunities for bids to be put in and indeed that will be done on an open competitive basis and I'm aware of St Columbanus and the real needs of the, of the school. Call Mr Gary Middleton. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can the Minister outline what steps he is taking to ensure that all uh, education sectors are being treated equally? Well, as moving ahead, I think that uh, I tend to indicate that both in terms of pupils, in terms of schools, in terms of sectors, will all be treated equally as we, we move ahead. Uh, I think in particular, uh, if you look at any school child uh, in whatever school, there's no child should be disadvantaged simply because of the badge that's, that's on their, their uniform. And I think that's an important principle uh, which I'll be taking forward. Uh, very specifically, uh, there will be issues around, for instance, area planning. And whereas there's good representation at some of the um, regional, or sorry, some of the, the local groups in that, I, I'll be trying to make sure that in terms of provision uh, of the key players, we'll all be at the, the top table when it comes to and have a say on the wider sort of regional area planning, because I think it's important to get buy-in of all sectors. We've also seen as part of the establishment of the Education Authority, again, there is a point where all the major players within education, possibly for the first time ever, which is one of the, I think, optimistic things that we can look forward to with the Education Authority, is that all of those, those parties will be around the table. In particular, I suppose, one area where there had been traditionally a gap, we've seen the establishment of the Controlled Schools Sectoral Council, uh, and I think it's important that they are there within the Education Authority as well. Mr Middleton for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Minister uh, for his answer? He mentioned there the Controlled Schools Support Council. Can he give an, an indication of what progress has been made in their establishment? Well, there was sort of, it was agreed by the Executive in 20, September 2014 that there would be the establishment of the Council. Um, funding was provided since October uh, 2014 uh, to the a working group that set up, they established the Controlled Schools Sector, Control Schools Sector Council, uh, and that the uh, CSSC will receive an annual grant of around about one million. It's expected to be operational in September 2016. Obviously, one of the first steps of that was the recruitment uh, process for the chief executive. Interviews were held on uh, the 25th of May. Uh, there has been somebody who's been agreed to receive that, that position. Uh, and the next step in terms of that is the recruitment of the three second tier senior management posts. That's due to commence shortly. And it's anticipated that the chief executive and the second tier staff uh, will all take up post on the 1st of September 2016. Uh, and finally, I suppose, as regards the controlled, uh, uh, controlled school sectoral council, subject to the finalising of the lease arrangement, uh, it's anticipated that the controlled school sectoral council will be located in Strumbullis College. Oh, Ms. Duan, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you'll be aware, um, on previous circumstances, when I have asked the Minister questions, it's been in a much less formal setting. Um, and I wish him every success in his new role as Minister for Education. Might I ask him through you, Mr. Speaker, um, what action he's taking to address uh, the shortage of post primary places in the controlled sector in Belfast? Thank the, the member for uh, her good wishes, albeit we're both of us in different roles. Uh, within that, uh, yes. There's obviously been pressure on particularly school places um, within the control sector, and particularly uh, the non-selective side of things, and that has happened both in the east of Belfast and the northern part. Uh, particularly, I suppose, very specifically, um, I visited the girls' model on, uh, on Friday, uh, was able to have an exchange with uh, some of the local representatives uh, on that. There's clearly a degree of impact. There's been uh, there's a longer term issue which will have to be looked at. In the short term, there has been uh, temporary variations have been sought by the boys model uh, and also by Hazelwood. Uh, and indeed, I would anticipate it's quite likely there will be an application for temporary variation uh, from the girls model as well. The first two have initially then been dealt with and been granted, so at least there's a degree of relieving of pressure. But there's also a longer term issue which the department will need to look at. Responding for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, would he provide an update on the long term development opportunities for Ashfield Boys and Girls Schools in East Belfast, please? Well, I think there's, there's two aspects to this. At the moment, there isn't a, a direct published development proposal for either of the schools. However, um, the EA has indicated that in the annual action plan for the period up to March 2017, that it will be consulting on the establishment of co educational, sorry, co education learning support centres for autism uh, spectrum disorder and key stage three and four general learning support at the schools 
uh, with the proposed effective date of the 1st of September 2017. Now, uh, as that is likely potentially to lead to a development proposal, which legally then I'll be the person who will be giving a final verdict on it. I can't comment on the, the particular merits of that, but also would indicate that, uh, mentioned that there's a longer term issue in terms of the pressure of school places within that. Now, we will also be in a position that uh, around about July of this year, uh, the next um, report will be produced of, on area planning across Northern Ireland. That will identify in a strategic way where there are pressures within the system, uh, and I would anticipate that would look particularly at the, the position uh, of East Belfast and to some extent also in North Belfast. Uh, and that will lead then to see how we can take how that issue then can be taken forward in a much more long-term way. Because I think for any school, if they are relying upon temporary variations, that's not a long-term solution. It needs to be also, mind you, looked at in the context of whatever pressures and opportunities and difficulties it will create also for uh, the wider school population within, within the area, because it's not just what will happen with an individual school. Mr. Declan Kearney. Or am I going to call you? Uh, would the Minister uh, give assurance to the House that he will give due consideration to the most recent report from the United Nations, which calls for the abolition of the transfer test? Uh, yeah, I had a funny feeling that the, the member may well be uh, asking that question. Clearly, the, the report itself is fairly lengthy in its, in its nature and covers a wide range of children's services. It impacts in, I think, not simply on uh, issues around education, but uh, I appreciate it will create a range of, of um, questions also for the, the, the Justice Minister. Uh, you know, I would say that the Department will give due consideration and give careful consideration to it. Uh, from my initial examination, there would be a number of aspects of it which I wouldn't necessarily be fully in support of. I think there would be a, a different view um, that I would take on, on a number of issues, not just on the issue of selection. You know, I've made it very clear in terms of the issue of selection uh, that I am somebody that supports the right of schools to select on the basis of academic ability. That is something that is enshrined now in legislation. And in many ways, from that point of view, it is something which, which has happened. And I think if, if we do potentially get into uh, with the different views around this, this house, a sort of form of trench warfare on whether we're pro-selection or anti-selection. I think one of the other dangers is at times there are a range of key issues within education which actually can make very significant difference to children's lives, particularly around issues around early intervention where I think focus needs to, to happen. Uh, and if we get bogged down in a battle over something which there isn't going to be a degree of consensus on, there's always a danger that we tend to ignore some of the other issues. So yes, the department will look at the full report but that does not mean there will be carte blanche agreement to the, um, the full report. Well, Mr Kearney, for a supplementary. Well, my year has that you, Ara. Thanks very much for your response, Minister. Would the Minister agree that it is important that uh, we take due regard of uh, international authorities on these matters, and that when we speak of consensus that it is entirely appropriate that we take regard of international opinion as well as the uh, collective opinion of the House? Yeah, I mean, it will not greatly surprise members, but one thing I have not, there's not been, there's not been a shortage of since I've become Minister of Education is a range of people and organisations offering me their opinion, all of which will be given proper due regard. Uh, you know, I, I accept any sort of international body will come up with particular conclusions, but I've also got to recognise, and from that point of view, I think there will be due regard taken of it. But we've also got to realise that we're in a system where there is a proper democratic accountability got to make judgments for ourselves and it, it's you know it's important always to take that level of advice but in the same way as if I was to give advice to a range of, of, of countries on what their practices should be um, you know it, it may not necessarily be the correct the correct conclusions uh, you know I think we've, we ultimately have to take our own decisions on that basis you know where I would agree with the report it mentions about a need to ensure that there is economic sorry education opportunity for all uh, my concern is that if we move away simply from academic selection, we actually in, entrench some of those differences. We create much more of an obvious situation, as, as you only need to look as far across uh, as across the water in England, uh, where there has been comprehensive education for a number of uh, for a large number of years. What that has led to actually is a greater level of entrenchment, where those who have the greatest ability to pay can pay for public schools, can send their children to the Eatons and Harrows. We see from the composition of the, of the current cabinet, for instance, 
And rather than aiding social mobility, rather than aiding educational opportunity, uh, I think it has then tended to be regressive in its, in its nature. So I, you know, I'm careful that we don't go down that line. But I appreciate uh, that I suspect that there will be many debates on the issue, particularly of academic selection. Uh, I suspect it may not be one in which there is agreement across the House on that. Members, time is up. I ask the members to take their ease while we change the top table. A point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm seeking some clarification on the ruling of members of the opposition asking supplementary questions. At the start of education questions today, Mr. O'Dowd and Mr. Middleton had questions which were grouped. Each of them was able to ask a supplementary before Mrs. Dobson was called for the opposition. But on the second question, Mr. Little and Mrs. Long had questions grouped but Mrs. Barton asked a question before Mrs. Long. It was my understanding, certainly whatever the case may be about Mr. Middleton, I understand he's certainly not a member of the opposition, uh, whether formal or informal, but it certainly was my understanding that all those who had tabled questions which were taken would be taken before the question of opposition supplementaries came up, and I'd appreciate your guidance on that. Uh, I, I want to point out that the, the error was mine at this table in terms of the sequencing on the first occasion. Uh, and on the second occasion was in line with the decision under the Good Friday Agreement, where in the first three questions, uh, the opposition speaker gets the preference before coming in. So it was an error on my part at the table, Mr Ford. Uh, 